has told him, curse David, then who shall say, why, are you do, why have you done so? Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son who came out from me seeks my life, and how, how much more now this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him. Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of this cursing this day. So you have David. He's been run out of Jerusalem by his own son. This man from the tribe of, of, of Benjamin, Senator Saul, has approached him, throwing rocks and cursing him. The rightful king, this man curses and throws stones at. Now, I don't know any kings. I'm pretty sure there's only ever been one king on this earth. Let me phrase that. Two kings on this earth who have taken this kind of abuse from a subject. Only two. We just read about one. Who's the other? I don't think Elvis is one of them. Jesus is the other one. Is there a comparison? Can we draw a comparison line between Jesus and David? You think that would be okay to do? Is David not God's most favorite? Will David not rule and reign in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom? Christ in the world throne? David on the throne of Jerusalem. That's how it's going to be. We'll get to that later. Not today, in a couple weeks. So you have, I want you guys to keep in your mind this story as we continue forth. Jesus and David being the same. Okay? When I say David... Think Jesus and apply the scenario. See if you can make the match. So David continues, continues on. And Shimei follows him, cursing and throwing stones at him. I'm guessing these weren't big, skull-crushing stones, you know, because if they killed him, they would not hold back David's men of valor. They would have slaughtered the poor man. So Shimei curses him, blames him for the death of Saul, Blames him for the death of all of Saul's lineage. You have David who forbids anybody to take his life for his sin. Any comparison there? He's not going to allow anyone to die for it. Shimei refuses the rule of David. He says, no, you're not the king. See the comparison? The Israelites say, no, you're not the Messiah. David accepted the rejection of Shimei. Christ accepted the rejection of Israel. It didn't make him happy. Shoot, he even knew what was going to happen before he got there. But still, Christ accepted it. Further on, David is like, I bit my tongue. No. <laughs> Definitely not now. Okay. Further on in the story, David ends up fighting Absalom and wins. So now David stands unopposed. When Christ died on the cross... He defeated Satan. He had to sacrifice his life. The battle was very different, but the end result is the same in our comparison. So David defeats him. And on his way through Baharim, is where we pick up back in Samuel. It'll be Samuel in chapter 19, verses 16 through 23. Then Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, who was from Baharim, hurried and came down from the, man, from the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, with Ziba, the, with Ziba the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons and his twenty servants with him. And they rushed to the Jordan before the king. Then they kept crossing the ford. Oh, then they kept, yeah, then they kept crossing the ford to bring over the king's household and to do what was good in his sight. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. 
So he said to the king, Lord, or no, I'm sorry, let not my Lord consider me guilty, nor remember what your servant did wrong on the day when my Lord, of the, my Lord the king came out from Jerusalem, so that the king would take it, of, take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come today, the first of all the house of Joseph, to go down to meet my Lord the king. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, I have a hard time with that word tonight. Abishai, the son of Zariah, should not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? David then said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zariah, that you should this day be an adversary to me? Should any man be put to death in Israel today? For do I not know that I am king over Israel? The king said to Shimei, You shall not die. Thus the king swore to him. So once again, look at our comparison, our contrast. The king is returning. And Shimei runs full speed ahead to get to that river, to hit his knees and beg God to deliver us. Please don't kill us, for we know we have sinned. And then Abishai, should he not die? Who's Abishai? Satan. He's the one who stands there on the right, on like looking at Christ, going, Are you kidding me? Look what he did. And then coming at us, look what you did. You don't deserve forgiveness. He doesn't deserve your forgiveness. But Christ is going to say, No, you shall not die. This, I, don't, I don't know how many times Satan has gone to God's ear and been like, look at him. He's sinning again. That's the 34th time today. How much longer are you going to put up with that little butthead? And Jesus says, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my blood supersedes whatever he's done. And I thank him for that. Anything I've done, remember, keyword there is done. Okay? I will never do anything to lose that grace. I'm not that stupid. I would encourage you guys to actually read those two again on your own time. And just think. When you think Jerusalem, think heaven. Think David, think Jesus. Absalom, or um, Abishai, think the devil. These comparisons are really obvious. <coughs> And they also apply to the end times. Because what Shimei did, he came and he hid his knees. And he acknowledged the king as king. He asked for forgiveness. That is the requirement to enter back into the Mosaic Covenant. And now that you guys know who Shimei is and what Shimei did, so again, you got to go back. You have David... The kingly leadership. Nathan, the prophet's pastor, pastoral leadership. Well, not actually, no, it'd be, it'd be prophets and teachers. Then you have Levi, your priests, pastors. Then you have Shimei. What is Shimei? When it says the Shimeiites, it includes them in there. The Shimeiites represent the common man, it's all that's left. It's what the other three upper echelon rule over or govern. The Shimeites, when you put the Shimeites in this category, the profound part of it is, is it doesn't matter what your status is, what's your stature, whether or not you're a gentleman. Eh? I don't think you were here for my gentleman's spiel, were you? A gentleman? The technical definition of a gentleman is not what we use the word for. When you said someone was a gentleman, you were not talking about their morals or the type of person that they were. You were telling someone a fact about them. That fact is they owned land. Any landowner was constituted as a gentleman. Doesn't matter what kind of, they could be a murderer. If they were, if they owned land, they were a gentleman. That's, yes, for being a landowner. That's it. It was, well, because landowners were wealthy. And that's all it was. It was a description of it was a description of their possession. 
not about the kind of character or person that they were. So it doesn't matter if you're a gentleman or not, like the rest of these, the other three classes. Every common man. Now, I want to read this to you again. This little last section, probably 13 and 14. Um, the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves. The house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves. The house of Levi by themselves and their wives by themselves. The house of Nathan, or uh, Shimei, the Shimeites by themselves and their wives by themselves. All houses by themselves and all wives by themselves. That's a lot of words to say nobody was near nobody. Imagine Jerusalem. It's full. There's 1,000 Jews in it. I'm just using 1,000 because 1, 000, a number, that number is easy to, easy to deal with. Okay, You have 1,000 before this war starts. This war has ensued. 666.6 have died. You're down to 333.3 Jews left. I'm not sure what point three of a Jew is, but let's just go with it. That's all you have left. Jerusalem's a big place. It wouldn't be hard to scatter one-third of the remaining Jews throughout Jerusalem. Okay? If you have all of those in the house of of David by themselves, what does that mean? It means there's nobody near them. And their wives by themselves, there's nobody near them. Notice there's no kids in this. They got taken. All the houses by themselves and their wives by themselves. The remaining Jews are scattered throughout Jerusalem. They are nowhere near each other. And this is where God's showing off. This is the cool part. You remove from the equation any kind of witness or one person telling the other person or any kind of exchange. You remove the ability for man to receive any credit when the entire remaining one-third in unison receives the Spirit and turns their life to God. Some preacher didn't come along and convince nobody. They were all by themselves and their wives by themselves when all of them enter in, or invoke the loophole and enter back under the Mosaic Covenant. God removed any possibility and made it clear, man will not receive credit for this. I will do this. And I'm going to do it when they're all by themselves. The entire remaining one-third will be utterly alone. There will be no one there to help them. They will all receive my Spirit, and they will all turn to me. How good is God? How good is He? Here's the other part to that little spiel I just did. If in some way it doesn't make sense in your mind, what is the requirement to come to God? Can anybody do it? At any time? Really? Can you? You think so? There's not a requirement in the Bible somewhere? John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Nobody can come to God at free will. There's not one person on this planet who can come to God at any moment in time. They can only come if God calls them. That is the one prerequisite. Now, God being God wants everyone to come right now. Don't wait. Don't delay. But He ain't going to call you if He knows you're not going to come. So He has to call you in order for you to come. That is the only requirement, is that God's Spirit must call you. Look back when they're all by themselves, and that Spirit is poured out on all of Jerusalem and its inhabitants. To receive the Spirit is to be called by the Spirit, essentially. Prayer and supplication. Repentance. So the Spirit 
calls the entire